Dear Capcom, <laughs> Hello. Thought you were safe, did you? Thought I couldn't possibly write to you because you largely cater to the console market? Thought I'd be ignoring you in favor of a more recent title like Gears of War or Titanfall 2? Well, think again! I mean, sure, I'll probably do an episode on Titanfall 2 or Gears of War. Uh, maybe. I mean, just look at Gears of War 4. It's... Okay, but there's no science as far as I've gotten, at least not sexy stuff. But you, Capcom, you know about the sexy stuff. You have guts! Actually, you're single-handedly responsible for one of my favorite games growing up as a kid, Mega Man X. And incidentally, you made the game that is most responsible for making me shit my pants in middle school, Resident evil. Which honestly seems kind of laughable now, especially if you look at the graphics, although to be entirely honest, they are a different kind of terrifying in their own right. I mean, what's scarier, an actual zombie dog or a misshapen and discolored collection of polygons that knows no fear and hungers only for human flesh? In either case, it's Halloween soon and I noticed that a remaster of the first Resident Evil game was for sale on Steam, so I picked it up and goddamn it looks good. The plot of the franchise as it's aged has gotten a bit rough around the edges, but in the beginning they knew what they were doing. Six people stuck in a creepy mansion filled with monsters and limited resources? Sometimes the simplest stuff works best. Resident Evil 2 and 3 takes place two months after the events of Resident Evil 1 when the entire town of Raccoon City has been completely overrun by zombies. And you know, in a world where we're convinced that a zombie apocalypse is just around the corner and are equally convinced that it could never really happen, I don't find myself asking the same types of questions I normally ask myself while playing games. I'm not examining the T-virus's feasibility, I'm not questioning the ludicrousness of decaying corpses somehow retaining enough brain functionality in the rotting heads to move, nor am I rolling my eyes at the absurdity of necrotic tissues and cells maintaining cell respiration somehow enough to move. I accept this. I accept zombies as my lord and savior! Between CRISPR, autonomy-robbing funguses, and ferality-inducing viruses, I'm willing to accept for now that zombies could exist. Let's just take that as a given. Instead, I'm curious about what an actual zombie epidemic would look like. Specifically, if we accept zombies as possible, what would actually happen? Could they reach epidemic or, God forbid, even pandemic levels? Or would the zombies fizzle out into nothingness in a matter of days due to being complete garbage at life? Cracked, of course, has already argued that it would fail miserably due to the advanced training imbued upon us by a media positively flooded with zombie movies, zombie video games, and zombie TV shows that somehow continue to release seasons in spite of their genuine terribleness. I agree, it's pretty likely that if any of us saw a real zombie right now, we would know exactly what to do. I stab her in the brain with a wooden stick. But what if we weren't trained in always zombie extermination? What if we weren't living, breathing, genre-savvy zombie destroyers? What if instead zombies were like any new disease we know next to nothing about, like Ebola, HIV, or Zika when they first appeared? Well, before we do that, and believe me, doing that is fucking incredible, we have to go over a few parameters first. Resident Evil has a particularly interesting zombie apocalypse scenario compared to others. Like most modern interpretations, the source is viral, the T-virus. 1966, a virus called the Progenitor Virus was discovered somewhere in Western Africa. And they decided to take that virus and turn it into the next wave of human evolution. Of course, things didn't go as planned, blah blah blah. Fast forward to the 90s and it's been turned into a biological weapon designed to wipe out entire combat zones without sending in soldiers by turning the enemies into walking corpses. Ta-da! This biological weapon is renamed the T-Virus. The T-Virus infects a host cells, burns through their available resources, and moves on. It causes permanent brain damage and unstoppable body-wide necrosis and essentially turns humans into feral beasts that irrationally crave the flesh of the living. Even more terrifying, for some reason it isn't limited to infecting living tissue and can effectively reanimate people who are already dead, although the difference between someone who has been infected as a dead person and someone who was infected while alive doesn't seem to be that great. TLDR, the virus turns folk into zombies. 
Cool! Means of infection. Now here's where things start to get pretty damned interesting. Bites from infected zombies can, of course, spread the virus to whomever's bitten, while also probably ensuring that their immune system is hella compromised from being bitten by what is effectively rotten meat with teeth. Unlike most games and stories, however, this isn't the only way folk can become zombies. The T-virus, while predominantly spread by other zombies, is also a waterborne illness and can be spread by vectors like mosquitoes and rats, not unlike malaria and the Black Plague. So, humanity's fucked, right? Well, not necessarily. Interestingly, a whopping 10% of the population displays a complete immunity to the T-virus. They simply can't be infected with it. So this, this is the beautiful nugget we needed all along. This upends every variable in traditional models and makes Resident Evil a vastly more complicated universe than most. But before you can understand why, first we have to talk about epidemiology. Epidemiology is exactly what it says on the tin, the study of epidemics. Epidemiologists study the spread of infections of every kind, from things as simple as the common cold to world-changing diseases like the human immunodeficiency virus. By studying maps, hospitalization figures, symptoms, transmission vectors, and general demographics, epidemiologists build complex, interlocking mathematical models that can help put together patterns that can be analyzed. If you can find the patterns behind what spreads diseases, you can hope hopefully address them and reduce the risk of spreading infections. Among the many, many tools on the utility belt of these nerdy superheroes lies an incredibly powerful one that, unfortunately, is incredibly boring to the average person. Differential Calculus. So, how can we marry calculus and epidemiology with video games? Simple. Statistical Epidemic Modeling. I present to you my brainchild, my masterpiece, the thing I've been working tirelessly on all week and have lost sleep over tweaking and perfecting, and my latest attempt to merge Nate Silver's economics brain with the world of video games, the SINSED model. The SINSED model is your one-stop shop for all things T-virus related. And let's break it down. It's based loosely around what's called the SIR model, short for Susceptible, Infected, and Recovered, but with way, way, way more parameters. The SIR model is used to predict the spread of simple diseases where healthy people get sick and eventually recover by placing people into three specific categories. And people move between these categories based on coefficients that are proportional to one another. For example, susceptible people are way, way more likely to get sick if there are more infected people walking around. Conversely, people who are already sick are constantly getting better and moving from the infected category to the recovered category and people in the recovered category can't get sick and do not get other people sick. Zombies, however, work completely differently, so I needed to build my own epidemiology model. And here it is. SINSED. Short for Susceptible, Infected, Zombies, and Dead, this model actually has five buckets people can fall into as opposed to the SIR model simplistic three. Let's go over the moving parts really quickly before we get to the good stuff. Susceptible folk are the same as the SIR model, and they move from susceptible to infected based on a transmission coefficient. People move from susceptible to infected in proportion to the number of zombies there are, since zombies are the primary vector for infection. Infected people move from the infected bucket to the zombie bucket based on a steady rate proportional to its own size, since there's really no factors that control the conversion other than the available pool of people with a T-virus inside of them and time. Now here's where things get interesting. People who are immune are in their own side bucket and they forgo the infected and zombie buckets entirely and enter a whole new one. Permadeath, since they can't be converted into zombies but can still be killed by them. This coefficient is half the coefficient of susceptible folk that became infected, presuming that half the people who encounter zombies die and half get away alive. However, living, breathing humans aren't likely to just let a zombie try and kill them without fighting back, so there's an effective reduction in the zombies that reduces in proportion to the total number of living human. Folk who manage to successfully destroy a zombie's brain move them into the permadeath bucket. Success! And that's it. So, how do we use this to realistically model a zombie apocalypse? Simple! We just need to know our factors. The outbreak in Raccoon City was at its peak in just over a week, with most of the population succumbing to the T-virus or death from zombies in the first couple of days. So, we plug our coefficients in, hit enter, and boom! Zombies have successfully invaded our Excel spreadsheet and can give us a pretty accurate picture of what happened in this poor, poor town that extends beyond what you see as a single character. And this picture is goddamned terrifying.
Things go to shit really fast, so we have to look at this by the hour. If Raccoon City starts with a mere 50 zombies compared to their population of 100,000, at first things are going relatively well. Humans are getting attacked for sure, but the panicked humans are actually managing to keep the zombie population in check, and they actually reduce the total infestation by half in the first eight hours. But then... Well, you see, someone unfamiliar with zombies isn't likely to know to go for the brain, especially within the first quarter of a day dealing with the zombies. You probably don't even know what they are, you're just putting them down and putting dead people into a pile to be dealt with later. But about 9 to 10 hours after the initial outbreak, shit starts to go fucking wrong. The bodies that you had in a pile that all died in the first wave start to get up, and there's way, way more zombies than there were before. In the next 10 hours, the number of zombies doubles and then doubles again. 24 hours after the first zombie bit the first human, things are starting to get out of control. There are over 9,000 infected or dead people that'll turn into zombies, and while there's only about 300 or so actually walking the streets soon, very soon, shit is about to get real. Hour by hour, more and more zombies stand up and start biting people, and by the time 48 hours have passed, a little over 500 people of the original 100,000 are still alive, 9,700 of them are zombies, and nearly 80,000 of them are corpses or infected on their way to increase the zombie population. Fuck! This explains the setting of Resident Evil 2 and 3 pretty well, though, and why you only very rarely run into other people throughout the course of the games. So what happens next? Well, in Resident Evil 2 and 3, you, the protagonist, are just trying to get out. You're not trying to end the crisis, you're not trying to find the source of the outbreak, the cure, and you're not trying to save the world, you're just trying to put as much physical distance between you and the fucking brain munchers as you possibly can. Thankfully, the United States government got saving the world covered because God bless democracy, God bless thermonuclear weapons, and God bless America! Recognizing that the situation is outside of their control and getting more and more chaotic, nine days after the first handful of zombies showed up in Raccoon City, Uncle Sam wipes the town off the map and turns the streets into glass with nukes. That seems like an extreme, unwarranted reaction, right? Wrong. If you truly have zombies this tenacious, allowing them to get a foothold as solid as an entire town the size of Raccoon City has cataclysmic consequences. If the United States decided on a no nukes policy, here's what would happen. Adding in a new modifier that accounts for a more widely dispersed population of 84 people per square mile, and providing that over time people get much, much better at not dying, the entire United States would be completely overrun by flesh-eating monsters in little over a month. And after that time, even if people died over 95% less to zombie attacks and got 1,000 times better at fighting them, the entire world's population would be reduced to 2% of its original total in just 6 months as zombies took over everything. In fact, by the time the United States falls, a nuclear response becomes less and less effective. With constant bombings that kill only zombies and no people, the remaining humans at 6 months would still be only at 4% as opposed to just two. In order to stop the spread of zombies to the entire world after the United States has been eliminated, foreign powers would effectively have to carpet bomb the entire United States with nuclear weapons every 10 days like clockwork. Only then could they mop up the remaining zombies using humans. The zombies eventually reduced to nothing in less than a year, but at a huge cost. Even with those nukes, 81% of the entire human population is dead by the end of the zombie crisis. This is a mass extinction event for humans. As seen in almost every projection, zombie pandemics don't happen because people are stupid. They happen because the onset of zombies escalates so quickly that half of the population is fucked by the time anyone's even remotely figured out what to do. So what lesson does Resident Evil teach us? The lesson here is that if zombies ever do come, you have to hit them fast and you have to hit them hard. You can't give them a chance to get a foothold because every hour means the chances of recovery decreases exponentially. So remember, if you ever, ever see a zombie, stab it in the brain, it wouldn't stick. And get your friends to do the same, because otherwise, you're putting the entire world at risk. Also, you should be washing your hands more frequently. Sincerely, Austin. P.S. Hey, see this shirt? It's awesome, isn't it? Do you want one? Well, you can't have one!
Just kidding. But soon I won't be! You see, these shirts, along with some other swag, are only available for the month of October, which is almost over, bitches! If you want one, you gotta act fast, because after October 31st, there won't be any left. Then how are you gonna show your science pride? Going to college and getting a master's degree? Sure, but you know... This is easier and cheaper. Just head on over to crowdmade.com slash shoddycast and pick out what you want.